So around the end of summer 2021, for whatever reason, I got the idea that I could build a demonstration fusion reactor in a couple months. And actually, I managed to get all the supplies and build one within the month. And I'm not exactly sure why I decided to do this, uh, and it seems that I can't find a lot of the footage of when I was actually putting stuff together for the first time, but I found a pickle jar, I found some wire, I bought a vacuum pump and some tubing, cut a little piece of acrylic to act as a lid, and then I found a rubber seal that happened to fit over the pickle jar, and then I tested it with some flybacks for providing high voltage. And for whatever reason, for like an entire week, I did not realize that I had connected the flyback backwards because flybacks are high voltage positive and I had connected the positive to the inner electrode, which is supposed to be negative. And of course, when I connected it up the right way, it immediately worked. And so I began to test different shapes for the inner electrode. This spiral shape produces quite a big glow, but it takes a lot more current and it doesn't produce a bright, concentrated bit of plasma right in the middle. Interestingly, this configuration produced the brightest spot right in the middle that I pretty much have ever gotten, which is weird considering how janky the whole setup was and that there was just electrical tape, like, on the electrode thing, and that was probably vaporizing and rapidly increasing the pressure, and pressure is the main thing that will affect how tight of a plasma you can get. Camera does not. Oh, actually, it is getting it. Camera. He's quite a sweet fellow, really. I think I'll call him Bob. Moments later, Bob is dismembered. As it turns out, using high power on a glass chamber with galvanized steel wire as the inner grid and plastic as insulators is not a great idea. In that particular picture, I think what happened is that the zinc vaporized because of the plasma and plated onto the glass, although it could have also been soot from the plastic. So I am actually in the process of building a new chamber that will use tungsten wire and ceramic insulators and a whole bunch of other stuff, and it'll be solid stainless steel to hopefully prevent that kind of thing from happening. At least the pickle jar didn't shatter and or implode before I got some cool videos of this, which is how the plasma reacts to a magnet according to Lorentz force. Ready? Do you hear that noise? That's the power some of you may have noticed a clicking in the background of some of these videos, and that is oh, that Geiger bad. counter, which I got because my mom was really concerned about radiation because it's a, you know, nuclear fever, although it didn't produce any radiation, and that cheap Geiger counter wouldn't have been able to detect any anyway. But having this Geiger counter, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, sent me on a rabbit hole of exploration into radioactivity. This seems like a good time to point out that this is a really crappy Geiger counter for pretty much anything except detecting the presence of radiation. And if you were going to do any sort of handling of open source radioactive materials, that is, materials that can spread contamination, you basically need a pancake probe or alpha scintillator. And those will cost a lot more than the 80 bucks I got this Geiger counter for. If you want my advice, just don't mess with radioactive stuff. It's way too easy to think you know what you're doing and mess something up and not know that you messed up until you get cancer two years later. With that being said, here's some of my exploration into radioactive materials. This is a really good example of why you need a pancake probe if you're going to be messing with things that can spread contamination. A pancake probe can detect really low energy stuff and can detect even the tiniest amount of increase above background. That was actually just potassium salt because potassium has a radioactive isotope. And this is a mystery rock that was very slightly radioactive. And these are some uranium glass marbles. 
Remember how I said the diffuser didn't produce any detectable radiation? Well, that's true, even with this way more sensitive detector. But, in a specific configuration where I added a giant capacitor and let the capacitor discharge at a higher voltage, that seems to produce bursts of low energy x-rays. Um. Many people suspect that this is just interference, but I did do a test without the chamber and the Geiger counter didn't detect anything, so I think it is x-ray production. Also, it forms a very different plasma inside the chamber. So after I finished the fuser, I thought I knew enough to build an x-ray machine safely. Yes, an x-ray machine. Thanks, William Osmond. At least I didn't use a medical x-ray tube, which can produce a lethal dose within minutes if used improperly. I essentially lucked out because later when measured with this good Geiger counter, I found out that the tube that I used produced a negligible x-ray dose. You still wouldn't want to be next to it, but it at least wasn't enough to kill you if you were in the same room. But with the cheap Geiger counter I had, I would not have been able to tell because that Geiger counter couldn't detect the type of x-rays that would be the most damaging. This is the reading from across the room, which maxed out at 500 counts per minute. It was actually about 1,000. For reference, background, which is normal, is about 60. Okay, so this is worst case scenario, as high as I can push the voltage at least. I think I can kind of above it. Notice in this video, I've left the Geiger counter right next to it and left the room and I'm controlling it from around a corner. I was not doing this when I first built it, so again, it is by complete chance that I was not irradiated. In this video, from a webcam positioned over it to make sure it didn't catch fire, yes, that's how sketchy it was, we can see hot pixels, which are x-rays hitting the sensor. This is a sign of very high radiation. That last audio clip failed for some reason. Another useful thing that I did with the Geiger counter was check for external contamination on an old radium smoke detector. This was not one of the super high activity smoke detectors, it was like 0.1 microcuries. So safe to handle as yeah, long as there good. wasn't contamination. Um, so I checked. We need to check this further away from the tank. And that's on the lowest scale. Okay. Let's see how high this goes. We're on the 1000 scale. Let's go fast. That's over 5000. Now we're going to the 10000s. About Stabilizing at about 10,000, just under that, 9,000. Let's see if we get, oh, huh, yep, it's directional just like the others, but that's a lot of beta. And that does appear to be beta because it doesn't rapidly increase like an inch away. Unfold. And we'll just take a quick swipe here. That's dusty. Okay, and now let's find and let's take a reading on this. All right, we're good. That's way lower than, okay. So, no contamination, at least on the outside, and the foil looks intact, it should be fine. Here, I take some readings on thorium mantles while practicing safe handling procedure of open source materials. Yeah, yeah sure, why not? Let's, first of all, survey my hand. Okay, my hand's good. What about my gloved hand? Yep. Interesting. And so this bag is definitely... Yeah. Actually, a quick test confirms that this bag is not contaminated, but rather that it has radon decay products in it, because the radiation goes down after like 24 hours, just leaving the bag closed. Sometime after this, I wanted more than just a pancake probe, so I bought a scintillator off of eBay, wired up with some one mega ohm resistors to make a voltage divider so that I could properly power each pin and attached a connector to connect it to my meter.
This is just regular background radiation, but because this probe measures gamma radiation, which much higher efficiency than the pancake probe, it reads about a thousand counts per minute. In this video, I think the loose wires cause it to read way higher than it should have been. Once I clean it up a little bit and put it in a little plastic cup on the end as an enclosure, the readings went right back down to what they're supposed to be. But it can still detect even slightly radioactive things like this little turquoise rock. Although obviously its ability to detect these things entirely depends on how much gamma radiation they emit, since I have some samples that are very active in the beta and alpha range, but it can barely detect them. And that rock is one of my least active samples, but it's just as active on the gamma scintillator as some of the more active samples. Okay, well, almost. Then I got a new sample, which is my most active yet, and as far as I'm willing to go, even with safe handling open source procedures. This is a small bottle of small pieces of uranium ore, some of which would make good cloud chamber sources. Unfortunately, it's basically gravel, which means that there are a ton of tiny pieces that could spread contamination. So I had to be very careful, and this is pretty much the only time I'm going to have the bottle open. I did take a couple good, bigger pieces out to use as cloud chamber sources and stored them separately, though. I not been recording. Did I run out of storage? Okay, I'm almost out of phone storage, so I gotta make this quick, but... The lead pig I store these in certainly isn't necessary, but it does block a good portion of the radiation, and it makes my family feel better, and ensures that it's not going to get misplaced anytime soon. Nice. One of the other reasons I bought this probe is because the signal that it emits changes in amplitude based on the actual energy of the gamma ray that it detects. You can easily see this on this oscilloscope, and what's even more interesting is that most isotopes emit certain energies of gamma radiation, which means that if we do some processing on this, we can create a graph of the gamma energies and identify the original isotope that emitted the radiation. And this is called a gamma spectrometer, and is the real reason why I bought the scintillator in the first place, as I intend to make one. To collect and process the signals from the gamma scintillator, we need a circuit that will convert those tiny amplitude and negative signals into a positive signal that a computer sound card can interpret. The simple circuit I used comes from Spirit532, who also helped me find the materials and knowledge I need to build the project. I'll leave a link to his step-by-step -step video on it in the description. After soldering the circuit together and tuning it based on what he specifies in his video, it still took me quite a bit of tuning to get any meaningful spectrum from this, and I ran into quite a few interesting errors along the way. Since you use the computer's sound card as input, this means that you can actually record the sound of the input from the scintillator. This also means that if you're not careful, you might use your actual microphone as input and get a very interesting spectrum. By far the weirdest error I encountered was this spectrum, which looks very, very similar to the actual spectrum of uranium ore, which is what I was using as the check source. But when I took the spectrometer out, it still gave that signal, meaning that it was not actually from the radiation, it was some form of harmonics or interference. I still don't know exactly what caused it, but it certainly was annoying. So, it has been a full day of gathering spectrums. I've gathered pretty much every sample I own, plus a few extra things like dust off of CRT screens, which I didn't really get anything, and also some potassium which I need a bigger sample to actually find the potassium peak, unfortunately. But anyway, so here is thorium at volume 44, which means I can see all the way out to this mysterious peak out here. 
um, and it doesn't really affect the resolution over here. So that's thorium, and you can see that the spectrum of uranium is quite a bit different. There's still three peaks in both, but the three, the two, these two peaks are closer in thorium, these are a little farther apart, and they are in different places even though these uh, scales are aligned. And there is some shifting with temperature, but not that much shifting. Then also, this is the Geiger counter test card, which I think is some uh, yellow cake, which is uranium, some sort of oxide, I think it's pentoxide or something. Uh, or it's a peroxide, I think. And if we compare that to the background taken at the same time frame and the same inside that lead container, which doesn't have the plug-in right now because I'm taking a background outside of the lead container to compare it with this one. But if we compare these two, you'll notice that there's this little... It, it evens out where there's two obvious peaks here, and this is with nothing, and with the Geiger counter test card, there's this peak here that kind of evens it out. And I believe that is the uranium-235 peak. Um, the reason that the uranium ore has these peaks is from the uranium or the radon decay products and the radium, which might be the radium one, might be a little bit far off of where my spectrum is right now. But then this, let's see, uh, where's the oh right. But the uranium in the Geiger counter test card does not have well uranium's half life is like a couple billion years, so it doesn't have, if you remove everything except the uranium, it doesn't have time to decay into enough radium and radon decay products to uh, produce these peaks, which is why we don't see those peaks with this. Even though, eh, we might see a little bit of peaks, but I would guess that that's from background radiation, which is just the, you know, uranium and radium in the ground making it through the lead container. And we will see if we also get those peaks. It looks like we are starting to get peaks for those in, uh, yeah, and I've only been running this for like 500 seconds, so that'll be interesting to see. And then this is the CRT dust, which interestingly we do get that is increased a little, but that might just be because it was on for longer. And I could not find anything for potassium, and this is just the background again. And here's possibly the most interesting discovery, which apparently I didn't have any footage of. So this is me while editing this video. So remember this turquoise rock? It's slightly radioactive, and I thought that's because it had traces of uranium and radium. The easy way to test that is to take a spectrum of it. So here's uranium, here's thorium, and here is the turquoise rock. So interestingly, actually, hang on, is that, it looks a little bit expanded, but I think that's because of the temperature difference. Um, but the spectrum from the turquoise rock lines up much better with thorium than it does with uranium. And then I also took a spectrum of that radium smoke detector that I decontaminated, well, actually a second one, because the first one got thrown out, which is stupid. Uh, and then... There's background for comparison. So you can see that is significantly above background, but I would have needed to take a longer spectrum to get finer results, or I can just smooth it. As one final, for now, test of the gamma spectrometer, I took it to an abandoned nuclear missile silo. Don't worry, we got permission. Oh yeah, green. Okay. That's cool. Crap. Contrary to what most people might expect, despite it being a nuclear missile silo, the readings when I took a gamma spectrum were actually about half as much as you would get from normal background radiation, which is probably because it's underground under like six feet of concrete which provides shielding against gamma. 
Well, that's actually going to be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed. As you can see, I've got a ton more projects that I've been working on. And so there should be some videos at some point in the future. Hopefully not too long from now. So if you watched this far to the end of the video, thank you. Leave a like, subscribe, etc. Uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you.